Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in today's session, um, my name is Paul Armstrong. I'm a lead architect based out of the UK. And I'm delighted to also have on stage with me later Nico from TUI, who you may have seen in this morning's keynote. He's going to talk about their personalized experience and what they've been doing with um, SageMaker and Bedrock on AWS. In today's session, we're, I'm going to introduce some of the challenges we typically see with digital asset management. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the digital asset management lifecycle, some of the considerations that you need to have in place when you're thinking about this, particularly when introducing AI into those processes. And then Nico's going to come and talk around how TUI have actually taken this and scaled it up and some of the business benefits that they've got from the solution. Then we'll, we'll summarize with a bit more about thinking about then if you've got digital assets and, and how you're managing them, what, what's the future of search look like and what are the possibilities there? And then finally, some key takeaways and some best practices for how you apply your AI solutions. So when we think about digital asset management, you have significant numbers of digital assets. And one of the challenges you have is consistency and quality. So how do you get your content editors prioritizing the right content for the right review? And as more and more demands are being put on content, you're actually having to generate more content for personalization purposes. So how do you optimize these results to make sure that you're actually directing traffic through direct channels? Really difficult but important business problems that need to be solved at scale. So what you're finding is your content editors are having more and more content to work through, and they've got to do it in the same time frames. So what you're looking for is how can you introduce AI into those processes to actually drive efficiency and scale? Now, whenever customers come to talk to us about best practices and how to leverage AI, we always talk about responsible AI and the responsible AI considerations. You will have heard it mentioned in the keynote this morning, and when we're looking at these mechanisms, we want to really think about the life cycle of your digital assets and how you're going to manage them. The controllability, the privacy and the security, the accuracy of your data. You don't want to be putting up in the case of TUI hotel descriptions that are inaccurate or are misleading your customers. You want transparency. You want the ability to actually have explainability of how you've come to the outcomes you, uh, you're looking at. So we always start with this framework of actually recommending you look you put in place your best practices and your measures for res responsible AI throughout your life cycle. But when you think about your digital asset management life cycle, you've got your usual content sources, you have your content, you have your building guidelines, maybe you've got your tone of voice, you create your assets, you have your approved content, which is then available for search. And ideally, you're looking for your bookings, your conversion rates, and back into your content sources. What AI is introducing into this is, how can you do apply your content creation guidelines automatically for review to reduce the workload on your content editors? And Nico will talk later on about some of the challenges and some of the, the improvements they've had in that overall life cycle. But when you think about digital mass asset management life cycle, you start with your, your content, you will have it in some sort of document store, and you will start to do some work with prompt engineering using your models. Maybe you'll use something like Claude, maybe you'll use something like Claude Instant, to actually come up with an appropriate solution. And notice this is in the proof of concept stage. What you're trying to do is evaluate the mechanism of how you apply the technology. Typically then, this will be a batch process, not necessarily inference, which you will then put through your models at scale to generate your overall content. But you're also going to have feedback mechanisms in place. And those feedback mechanisms may be event-driven, 
to also update or create content to put it through your model into your store. And this is where you may introduce workflows and you may introduce step functions in terms of sequencing. And we'll hear a bit more about that in detail later on. This then gives you your content which your consumers can then search and manage against. Now, you, you may notice that throughout this life cycle, there are humans in the loop. This is not about removing individuals from the process, but at all stages of the process, having humans inspecting the content, verifying the quality, and verifying that actually through every stage of the process, from training right through to the actual delivery of the content, that you have those feedback mechanisms. And we're going to talk about this in a bit more detail later on, but it's really, really important that you, in, you include your stakeholders from the very beginning in the process. From the creation of your training data, through to the feedback mechanisms of the output of your models, and providing those real-time mechanisms all the way through the solution to enable you to get to the outcomes that you're looking for and to have total confidence in your output based on your responsible AI framework. So now I'm delighted to hand you over to Nico, who's going to talk you through in more detail what him and the team have been doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicolas Avitsanos, and I'm extremely excited to be here with you today to discuss how we utilize Gen AI and TUI in order to scale and enhance our content quality. Before I dive into today's use case, let me tell you a couple of words about who is TUI, in case anyone has not heard of us before. TUI is an end-to-end -end holiday provider. We are one of the largest organizations in Europe with more than 55,000 employees. Our headquarters are in Hanover in Germany, and we have head offices in 13 countries across Europe, and we operate in three European regions. Most people, they don't really know that actually TUI is an asset company. We own more than 100 aircrafts, 400 plus hotels, 18 cruise ships. We travel to more than 140 different destinations across the world. And we aim to increase this number each and every year. But most important, and also we have more than 1,600 retail stores. But most importantly, 21 million customers per year trust us with their holidays. And this is a responsibility that we take very, very seriously. This is why every time that we communicate with our customers, we want to communicate with our own brand, with our own tone of voice. And this is why we build the TUI tone of voice engine. Before I explain in detail what the TUI tone of voice engine is, let me walk you through our problem. Over the last few years, a big, a growing part of TUI business is to provide dynamic hotels and dynamic hotel packages to our customers. By dynamic hotels, we mean the hotels that they are not owned by TUI, and we receive their availability alongside with their content from third-party providers. Unfortunately, this comes with some implications. This third-party content is not well written. It doesn't have the TUI tone of voice. And also, a lot of time, it includes misinformation. As you can understand, this can be extremely confusing to you, our customers. This is why our content team, the team responsible for all the content that we advertise and we promote, spend a good amount of their time trying to rewrite this hotel description and bring them to the TUI standards. But they are facing some challenges. The first one is, as we said, these third-party hotel descriptions, they are lacking the TUI identity, the TUI tone of voice. Also, they have a low SEO score. Since a lot of similar companies with us, they advertise exactly the same content and they are getting the same content from the, the same providers. Additionally, we expect that the amount of the dynamic hotels that we will offer to our customer will be more than 100,000 very, very soon. As you can understand, this kind of task is not feasible for one single team. This is why it's a necessity to provide to the content team with a tool that will allow them to scale. So what we are trying to achieve, we want to enable the content team to be as productive as possible 
deliver more than ever, and to decrease our workload. We want to do that by improving the quality, the consistency, and the efficiency of the content creation process. This is why we introduced this generative AI tool that can generate hotel descriptions comparable to the TUI brand editorial content. It will align with the TUI tone of voice. It will, be, it will achieve an SEO score comparable to the benchmark. And most importantly, it will reduce the time required to generate new content. From a task until today would take more than eight hours, we can deliver that now in a matter of minutes. And now the fun part. How we actually build that? I'm sure you already know, if you have worked in any generative AI project, the first couple of things that you do is your model selection and prompt engineering. The model selection is a process that needs to be reevaluated quite often. The industry is extremely active and new models are coming out each and every week. In our case, when we were developing this project, one of the best models available was CLO2, a really good model in following rules and generating content. It was also available through Bedrock. This allowed us to keep all of our data into AWS ecosystem. Now that we have selected our model, we start by formatting our prompt. One of the first things that we did, we defined our persona. In our case, it was a British copywriter from TUI, and your task is to rewrite this hotel description in the TUI tone of voice. After we described the TUI tone of voice, we did that by implementing a technique called back prompt engineering. The idea is simple. You ask the model to describe the tone of voice by giving a couple of really well-written hotel descriptions that the content team has uh, written for us, and you ask to describe the tone of voice. You get this answer, and you add it to your prompt. We also include some editorial guidelines, for example, some words that we didn't want to appear in our hotel descriptions, some uh, details about how the answer we want to look like, uh, for example, the length of the answer, and finally, we apply the few shot prompting. Again, a simple idea, you add a couple of well-written hotel descriptions in your prompt, and you ask the model to mimic this hotel description. I'm not sure if you can see, but in the light blue box is an example, a snippet, uh, and condensed overview of how prompt looked like. Now that we have our model, we have our prompt, we, dis we generated some hotel descriptions, and we ask the content team for feedback. As Paul said, one of the key factors of the success of this project was how close we were with the content team. And this allowed us to understand where we can improve and what challenges the model was facing. And in, in this first phase, we faced a lot of challenges. The first one was that actually the model did not follow that well the tweet on a voice. It did not follow all the SEO guidelines. It started hallucinating, it started creating information that were, they were not there in the original hotel description. We had some issues uh, about the ban words and the formatting. And also, we had some issues about uh, the American English, the model output American English instead of British English. It's safe to say that this first phase was a disaster. And this is why we drove, this, all these drove us to move to a second phase, find a model. CLO2 back then was not available uh, for fine-tuning, but also it's not a very good practice to start fine-tuning these extremely large language models. What we decided to do after playing a little bit around with the models that were open source, um, reading the literature, see what the industry was doing, we decided to fine-tune Llama 213B. We fine-tune Llama 213B using SageMaker and technique uh, called Culora. We use a relatively small sample uh, data set of approximately 4,500 well-written hotel description. And we use some NLP matrices in order to monitor the performance of the model during training. Again, after the fine-tuning, we ask the content team for feedback. And we find out a lot of improvements. The first was that the model actually started mimicking quite well the tweet on a voice. We follow SEO guidelines, even some of those that we didn't specify in our prompt. It did not hallucinate. 
It did not use banned words. But we still had some issues with the formatting and the American English. But at this point, everyone started getting a little bit excited. The IT, the business, the content team. They could see that generative AI can actually provide them with something useful, something that will improve their life. But we still had some room for improvement. And this is why we decided to bring the best of both worlds. We decided to stack the two models, and we got the output of the Llama 2 model that is already quite good, that can follow quite well the two tone of voice. And we passed that through Cloud 2 with an improved prompt that only was focusing on the remaining challenges and the formatting issues. And we managed to succeed in all of our tasks. Now the content team has a tool that can generate quite well hotel descriptions, really similar to what a content creator would generate by himself. This is our architecture diagram. Obviously, it wouldn't be a technical session without it. I think the most important part here is that it looks really similar with any MLOps pipeline you have seen before. The difference is that instead of our traditional machine learning model, we have a large language model. We have our SageMaker training job that we train and fine tune our Llama 2 model. We store that to model registry. And by the time that we receive data uh, from the third party provider, we initiate a step function workflow that in a batch format will generate our well-written hotel descriptions. Now that we have our well-written hotel descriptions, we'll calculate the ACO score using a third-party API called Search Metrics, and we'll store the well-written hotel description in our DynamoDB table alongside with ACO score. And this DynamoDB table will empower a content UI that the content team was able to give us feedback on. Before we go, we clear up the house. We clean our endpoints, we clean anything we don't need. Model evaluation. You have heard a lot, and in our case, it was extremely important. Again, the key factor was the human feedback and the feedback that we were receiving from the content team. One of the very last experiments that we did was we blindly asked, we, we asked the content team to blindly rank four different hotel descriptions, and including the generated text and the original text. We find out that 75% of the time, the generated text from our final model came first. Also, a big and an important role was the SEO score. We calculate the SEO score of our generated text, and we compare that to the benchmark. We managed to increase that by 4%. So what are the key outcomes? It's safe to say that two ton of voice engine can generate well-written hotel descriptions that aligns with the two tone of voice and editorial guidelines. We are able to generate five times faster tech, uh, content. We increase the SEO score by 4%. And we are able to scale. We can generate more than 100,000 hotel descriptions in a matter of hours. And the most important part, we keep the same quality and consistency across all the hotel descriptions. What are our next, next steps? If you hear in the morning, our CAO, Peter Jordan, stated that TUI is committed to utilize Gen AI in, in changing our traditional way that we operate. We want to be more efficient, and we want to provide to our customer a more personalized experience. This use case is a great example of that. In this, this architecture demonstrated that GenAI can successfully tackle this task. And this is a transformational way, transformational change in the way that we are creating content. So right now, we are integrating the two a voice engine into the current content creation process. We need to be respectful in the way that the content team operates and allow them to be as efficient and as productive as possible. We are committed in maintaining the human in the loop. As I said before, our customer trusts our quality and our brand. And we want to safeguard the TUI brand every step of the way. Finally, we want to roll out this model to more markets and different languages. 
This will allow our customer to have a more personalized experience. Thank you very much. I will hand over now back to Paul that he's gonna talk about the search. Thank you, Nico. Aren't they just amazing results? I think there's a round of applause there. <laughs> So one of the other areas for next steps for digital asset management is search. And customers are expecting a very, very different experience moving forward. And when you think about the evolution of searching, we used to start with text-based matching, then we went to more facet-based search. Now Gen AI is really opening up the possibilities for us to become more conversational in terms of how we search. So what you're seeing, and you heard this mentioned in the keynote this morning, is more and more RAG workflows. And when you think about a RAG workflow, you can apply it either via a RAG workflow or you can do some fine tuning of models. But RAG is actually better when you've got fairly large and dynamic content. So if you've got content sources that are regularly changing, RAG is a really, really effective mechanism for enabling you to bring content back to customers in a more natural way. And when you think about the process, you submit a question. That query is then represented and converted into a vector representation. You do a similarity search, and you will get back the relevant matching documents. In this case, they would be hotel descriptions. But then you need to do some context aggregation. You bring together all of that content, you then apply another prompt to it to then refine the response to make it tailored to the original question that you asked for. And you can see how this really applies in, for example, the holiday experience. I'd like to find a hotel within an hour's transfer of the airport, 10 minutes near the beach with an adult only pool. They're the types of things that you're starting to want to be asking of these types of systems. And as you've noticed, really RAG depends on vector similarity searches. And you can see that a vector similarity search is how generative AI models understand unstructured data and the context. So vectors make it easy to find similar content in very, very large unstructured data. And this gives you the search ability to find similar items or entities based on the distance between the objects. So vector databases, they're allowing you to store, search, and retrieve your embeddings in, in a scalable manner. They still need all the usual um, updates and creates and deletes that you need to support, but you also need to be able to do this in real time. Which is where Vector Engine for Open Search Serverless comes in. It's a simple, high-performing and scalable serverless vector database store designed to build ML augmented search experiences. Highly performant, highly search capabilities over very, very large vector stores. Enables you to optimize, fine tune your results, and you can really develop secure, reliable, and a mature platform moving forwards. And when you think about the architecture, it's really, really key that your main architectural principles stay in place. You separate your compute and your storage. You separate your indexing from your search capabilities. And here, then, you also have your multiple redundancy, so you can run across multiple availability zones to, um, to mitigate against failures and improve your resiliency. Also supporting auto-scaling. So what you're seeing is this is a very familiar architecture that you're used to running, but now you're doing it across vector stores with millions of parameters. Now, when you think about vector engine features, you need to think about what are the underlying algorithms that actually support them going forwards. Now, the vector engine supports what's called HNSW, and that's a state-of-the-art algorithm used for a proximal search of nearest neighbor. And it supports two popular implementations, FAS and NSM lib. But it also supports different distant algorithms because what you're trying to do is align your, your algorithm to the data. 
So for example, when we were talking around trying to find similar matches on content, we were talking around using things like um, cosine similarity for semantic search and the ability to fine tune these parameters. Why is this important? Well, all through this process, what you are trying to do is really think about the optimum memory storage trade-off as you have always done with any storage content. So it's really, really important that you're, you're, you're fine-tuning your model as you're using the right number of dimensions to give you the ac accurate results at the right price and cost point. And the other thing that's really, really important with search is you're augmenting existing solutions that you already have. Yes, these, these um, search stores do support very, very large um, updates. They do support indexing. However, you also want to think about combining the types of searches. So you will have transactional data. You will want to add additional metadata to your documents that you maintain in your document store. What this then enables you to do is combine your content in two ways. It enables you to do pre-filtering. So for example, in the case of hotel descriptions, maybe you want to pre-filter by price. Maybe you want to pre-filter by availability. Maybe there's some other criteria that you want to apply. And what this enables you to do is support up to, in the case of OpenSearch Serverless, a thousand fields to, to really fine tune your query and the accuracy of the results that you bring back to your team. So you can see that the evolution of digital asset management doesn't stop with the content creation. You then want to also move on to how are you really going to enhance and improve the customer experience and give them the natural language interfaces that you're really looking for. So there's quite a lot that we've covered through here in terms of the life cycle of digital asset management. And when we start thinking about this in terms of the overall process, there are several things that we need to consider in terms of time, in terms of cost, and, in, and also in terms of best practice. So there's probably four areas that we're going to just cover off in the last, last sort of 15 minutes just to really reinforce the journey that we've been through. I think it's really, really important to see the, the amazing results that came from the, from the work that TUI have been doing. But also, it's worth just taking a minute to go back and think about the steps that we went through. Now, the first thing that's really important with your AI solutions is select carefully. You heard Peter Jordan, the group CAO, talking this morning about how Gen AI is fundamental to TUI moving forward. However, we also spent probably two to three weeks really prioritizing all the use cases and really evaluating, are they actually the appropriate Gen AI use cases that will deliver the business value that we're expecting? Gen AI comes at a cost. And it's really, really important you have the trade-off of cost to business benefit and are continually measuring that. It's also important that you think about the future because this is an area where models are continually changing. Already we're talking about moving from Claude 2 to Claude 3 in the solution that TUI talked around. But it's really, really important when you're looking at these processes that you also consider mobility in terms of what type of the modality, sorry, of the model. So you think about, are you doing text-based searches, as we are in this case? Are you doing image-based searches? What does that mean? And what does that mean from a cost and performance point? Because this evaluation is really, really critical to ensuring that you optimize the experience in terms of the models that you pr promote. And as you saw, it, it, the significance in terms of the, the impact of the SEO optimization and also the, the content creation enabled the team to scale. And they were the measures and the KPIs that were put in place 
from the very start. Now we, we put up the architectural diagram, but there are a few things in there to really think about that was really, really critical throughout the life cycle of the project. Yes, we talked about the responsible AI aspects, but we also needed to talk around the privacy, security, and transparency aspects. If you look at the solution, everything was operating within VPCs. We were making sure the data never ever left the VPC in the target region. We were making sure the data, the prompts, the customized LLM were all controlled and all managed throughout the life cycle. We clearly outlined what and why and how the data was being used, and that was actually defined up front with the content editors. You saw the flow of the data. You saw, saw when we did the original reference architecture. It was really, really important that we actually in, ensured that we knew where the data was throughout the life cycle of the ad, um, asset management system. It was also really important that not only did we control that flow, but we had that traceability. And what was really interesting, particularly in the two we use case, was this was already building on all the processes that they had in place and augmenting the existing systems that they had in place. So you can see that this isn't about a massive change to business process or your underlying IT infrastructure. This is about incremental changes, augmenting your existing systems, augmenting your data stores, ensuring that you're maintaining your best practices and your data privacy guidelines as you do today, but also making sure that when you run your proof of concepts, you're running them to ensure the accuracy of the content. One of the things that we really focused on was very much around ensuring, you know, the early models were hallucinating. Um, the disaster, as Nico called it, in terms of the initial responses. There was a real lack of trust in the underlying technology. This was really, really important because the business users have to go on the journey in terms of the management of that end-to-end -end life cycle. So data privacy and ensuring the accuracy of content and all of the usual best practices you will have today with your data guidelines. This is not a huge change. This is an incremental change. I think that's a really, really interesting thing to draw out from the, um, the use case. As Nico suggested, what, what TUI were doing was building on their existing MLOps pipelines. You saw how they had inference endpoints that they were spinning up when they were running batch jobs, then tearing down when they were finished, when they were using SageMaker. All the things that you do today, the only difference being the endpoint happened to be an LLM model. Humans are required. Generative AI is not replacing humans in the loop at all. However, you need your knowledge domain experts, and they are critical. You can hear from the use case how it was absolutely essential that the content team were included in the process from the very beginning. This was not about applying the technology and then feeding it back to the, loop, um, to the users. We've recently been working with, um, on, on another solution with a customer, and we actually had business users creating those prompts to understand how the models were actually behaving, to start to get that confidence in terms of the output. And they can provide that immediate feedback in terms of the, the, they are the knowledge experts in the domain. And those feedback loops, absolutely critical. Whatever workflow you're doing, you need a mechanism for providing feedback to the assets that are being created. So in the, in the case of the TUI solution, there was a thumbs up, there was a thumbs down. You could apply why the content didn't quite meet the criteria, what was wrong with it. This enabled further fine tuning and further enhancement of the overall process. And this is really, really key in your operational design. Because these models are going to be continually changing, you really, really have to consider how your operational design is going to run. Because humans are going to be absolutely critical in terms of that end-to-end -end life cycle. 
So the, the, one, the most important takeaway I would take out of all of these is this is not replacing the teams that you have today. This is really, really important that the messaging is this is about how can you really improve efficiency, which then enables you to scale at pace. And this communication. We've talked about this open communication of the technology throughout the life cycle. It's absolutely critical in terms of the management of how you actually manage your, your stakeholders. If stakeholders are included in the beginning, they will let go on the journey with you and they will build the trust of the underlying technology. The, they need an environment where they can use the technology in a safe way and evaluate the content. You want to be incredibly careful what you put in front of your customers. We've, we've heard some of the stories of things that haven't gone quite as they should with customers. You need to also understand why generative AI is going to be important for your organization. As Peter Jordan mentioned this morning, this is fundamental for the whole organization, but it's fundamental from the board down to the people on the ground operating the hotels for TUI. And this is really, really important. How many of your board members have actively used generative AI in their day-to-day -day jobs? Do they understand the technology? Do they understand the implications of using it? Do they understand where their data is going? Really, really important that that education is coming through in everything that you deliver in terms of your outputs and your solutions. And establishing a generative AI center of excellence. We, we've had cloud center of excellences and an AI center of excellence. Why is it a generative AI center of excellence important? Because you have so many more stakeholders now leveraging the technology. Are you comfortable that your business users are putting the appropriate data through your AI models in the appropriate way with the appropriate controls? And this is not about restricting creativity, but it's making sure that you are comfortable that all of your users are fully educated in the process of what they're running, how they're running it, and why they're running these things through. So you can see that those four, four takeaways really, really key in terms of how you ensure that your teams are running effectively in these solutions. So just to recap on, on where we've got to, we started with the challenges of digital asset management. We talked around how you would go about setting these solutions and automating the processes. We've then shown how TUI have actually brought all of these things together and shown how they actually have delivered value, me measurable outputs, and delivered those goals that they were looking for. And then we've talked around some of the best practices that you apply from responsible AI, responsible um, um, data usage, and thinking about how you integrate humans in the loop all the way through these solutions. And this is your traditional projects. You're going to have many of these AI projects running at pace and at scale. And one of the things that you have to really recognize with these types of solutions is they are continually changing. You are not going to put a solution out and then, you, then it's, it, it's finished. You're continually re-evaluating. So how are you considering your operating model? How is that changing in terms of the life cycle of your ops? How is this changing in terms of best practices? And how are you evolving as an organization to a better align to ensure that your business users and your IT users are aligned on how they're working against their best practices? Fast experimentation. One of the things that this is really bringing through is how quickly this solution was came to life. So one of the things that Nico didn't mention in his solution was how quickly they came to the outcome. That solution was run over a six week period of time to get to that initial outcome. There was lots of iterations and you're gonna have many projects, many LLMs, and you're going to build to experiment. 
So this experimental approach to this type of outcome is really, really key. The other thing to really recognize is nothing hasn't, has really changed. You still use CICD, DevOps, we may call it LLM ops now, and there will be some subtleties in terms of the processes that you're running, but actually you're evolving in terms of how you actually run your experimentation. Again, this is incremental, really, really key in terms of, yes, this is amazing technology, but you should be building on your best practices, building on all of the processes that you have in place today. So hopefully that has given you an understanding of the solution. We will be around if anyone wants to talk to us after, this, after the session. And thank you so much for your time. There are, as you know, the, the training and certification, and there's the opportunity to come to do the, the classroom or the online learning at your own place. Please, at pace. Please come and visit the, the Skills Builder, our online center. We've got over 600 free digital courses. You can sign up for a free seven-day trial, and it's a great opportunity to get hands-on with some of this technology and really start to innovate and drive your solutions at scale. Thank you for listening. Please do complete the surveys, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit and the rest of the day. Thank you for your time.